Yes, it's that time again, far middle time. That's a half an hour or so of intriguing talk on today's pressing issues. It's the key part of everybody's week, I'm sure of that. Nick Dioli is here. I hope you're doing well this late summer. And when it comes to our dedication for episode 66, well, this is one of the easiest decisions in the history of the far middle. 66 immediately conjures up images of all of those electric goals and all those awesome moments brought to us by Mario Lemieux. Lemieux was a phenom coming out of his hometown Montreal, drafted in the summer of 84 by the Penguins, of course, 18 years old at the time, six foot four frame. And when he was up for the draft, the urban legend that's become widely accepted was that not only did the Penguins general manager, Eddie Johnson, tank the Penguin season in 83-84 and finish last behind the Devils so that he could guarantee the first selection in a draft to pick Mario Lemieux, but also that Eddie Johnson was offered all of the Montreal Canadiens draft picks that year for the Penguins' first round pick, so the Canadiens could end up selecting their hometown boy. Now, it was rumored to have fallen apart, those trade talks, that is, when the Penguins insisted the Canadians also throw in their first round pick in the next year's draft in 85. So whether it's true or not, I'm not sure, but the Penguins definitely made the most of the first overall pick in 1984 when they picked Lemieux. Now, Mario chose 66 as his number in reference to Wayne Gretzky and the inevitable comparisons that would occur at the time. 66 is 99 upside down. And he started out his career in storybook fashion. So first game, first shift, first shot equals goal. He overcame cancer in the middle of his career and continued to thrive after he beat cancer. Uh, Mario is a bit like Mantle, I think, at least from my perspective, in that many ask, right, what would have been and what could have been tallied statistically if uh, if Mario, in his case, was free from cancer and uh, and didn't have those back problems that plagued him for years, just like Mantle with his knees. And Lemieux became an owner when the Penguins went bankrupt after the early 90s and all those, uh, those Stanley Cup wins, the Para Cup wins. And he was owed money as a player, so he took equity as a creditor, effectively. And then what did he do once he became an owner? He helped lead the charge to resurrect the franchise, turn it profitable, and become a winner again. And he ended up seeing a franchise that won three more cups. And basically, he made the Penguins brand one of the best, not just in the NHL, but frankly, in all the pro sports. So Pittsburgh's an interesting sports town. It's a great sports town. But in many ways, the way I think of it, it was once a Pirates baseball town in the 1960s that became or evolved a Steelers football town in the 70s, but today is probably more of a Penguins hockey town than anything else. And Lemieux's impact went beyond the Penguins as well. He took a a hockey backwater of Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania, made it one of the hottest hockey areas outside of Canada. Before Mario Lemieux, no ice rinks in this city to speak of. You could count them on one hand. Today, the NHL is stocked with Western Pennsylvania talent because her parents grew up watching Lemieux. He started his foundation. That foundation's invested millions into various regional efforts through the years. And then when you look at his stats across his career as a player, uh, the best word I can sort of come up with to to summarize his statistics are astounding. 690 goals, uh, points per game 1.88, so just under a 1.9 point per goal clip on average across his career. Um, Five cups, two as a player, three as an owner, six Art Art Ross trophies, um, three-time league MVP, and of course both those cups he won as a player. He was the Stanley Cup playoff MVP as well. And in 1988-89, that season, he had a pretty decent goal tally of 85 goals. Now all of that was accomplished and done at a time when Lemieux was literally literally mugged regularly on the ice. And if the Gretzky rules applied to Mario, there's no telling what his numbers would have looked like. So Lemieux reminds me also of our dedication subject for episode 23, Uh, perhaps the only one that was easier than this one so far when it came to dedications, which of course went to Michael Jordan. And and what are the similarities uh, between Jordan and Lemieux? Well, both are raw, massive talents that anyone could see as soon as they watch them, they both you know, instantly pass the eye test. And the type of talent that they had was the type that you just had to watch. I mean, it was just a very um, viewable type of a performance in an athlete that, uh, that sometimes you know, just took your breath away with how, how good they were at their craft. And both getting very rough treatment for years by opponents to the point where you wondered, 
know, what the leagues were thinking by letting their biggest draws get assaulted on a regular basis. So, you know, both had to basically deal with those types of adversaries. Jordan, mostly with the Detroit Pistons. Um, Lemieux, Mario, mostly with uh, teams like the Flyers, but, but similarities there. And both had to evolve from doing it all themselves to where they brought the team along to the point where the teams won the ultimate prizes, right? Whether it's an NBA championship or a Stanley Cup. And of course, when they were able to do that, that only further polished the legacies of Jordan and Lemieux. And yes, both love the golf, which I don't get, but whatever. By the way, um, what does Lemieux translate to in English? The best. So you can't make stuff up like this in life. Episode 66 goes to the one and only Mario Lemieux. So let's start connecting those dots. And I want to start by staying on hockey greats, that subject, because I am fired up with all this Lemieux talk. Mount Rushmore of hockey. Who's on Mount Rushmore when it comes to NHL greats? we got four slots. So certainly, you got to put Gretzky and you have to put Lemieux up there. But then from there, those two remaining slots, it gets really, really tough. you got two spots left, and you got names like Rocket Richard, Bobby Orr, Mike Bossy, Alex Ovechkin, Gordie Howe, Sidney Crosby. I'm not putting McDavid in the conversation yet. I might do that a couple years down the road, but not just yet. And I also thought about Yager, Yammer Yager, and the lovable Yager. You know, he had the talent and the stats for sure. But, you know, over his career, he was a bit of a mercenary. Uh, so we're going to hold him off that, that group to consider for those final two slots. So let's go through just sort of the logic of those names that, uh, that I put out there. Who are the two within that group that we would add to Gretzky and Lemieux on the Mount Rushmore? So Bossy, love Bossy, right? We dedicated a, a prior far middle episode to him. Great pure goal scorer, but he just wasn't as multifaceted as the others. Um, Gordy Howe, wow, you, you think of old school hockey and, and you immediately think of Gordy Howe. He created the notion of the Gordy Howe hat trick, of course, with a goal and assist in a fight in a game. But, you know, again, thinking through that, mm, I'll, I'll just put him to the side for a second. You got Rocket Richard, right? Art, intensity on the ice. Um, but, you know, thinking this through, I cannot not put Bobby Orr as the greatest defenseman of all time on that Mount Rushmore. He has to be up there. He redefined defense, redefined the whole way people think of defensemen. So he's up there for sure. And as great as Crosby is and as much of a fan I am of his total game and his dedication and his preparation, I've got to go with that fourth and final slot. I've got to go with Alex Ovechkin. That's right. you got a Pittsburgh guy picking a capital. But here's the thing about Ovi. He might end up breaking Gretzky's goal total for a career of 894. And he was and remained so physical in his game. So I've got to go on my Mount Rushmore with Lemieux, Gretzky, or in Ovechkin, especially, especially if Ovechkin breaks the 800 goal threshold and surpasses Gordy Howe at number two overall for career goals, which I think he's surely going to do because Ovechkin's sitting right now at 780, so he doesn't have far to go. That's a great Mount Rushmore for sure. Let's see a couple years down the road if Connor McDavid pushes one of those four off the mountain and puts his own mug up on, on that facade. Now, the NHL and pro sports, they suffered a bit with attendance during and coming off of pandemic shutdowns. And that brings us to the next dot to connect. And again, we're connecting dots. Why? Because it's an homage to BBC's Connections. That series, that science series was hosted by the great Dr. James Burke. But, you know, the next issue, next dot to connect, how ridership is plummeting across major urban public transportation networks. Now, the most recent data I saw that I wanted to share with you is for New York City. It came from the MTA, and officials at the MTA now say that New York's buses and subways and trains, they're not going to return to pre-pandemic ridership levels in the next 10 years. So they don't see things rebounding for a decade. The MTA expects 2023's ridership to be less than 70% of what it was in 2019, and that's a huge, of course, drop-off. MTA was hoping for about an 86% level of ridership compared to 19 and it's not going to even get close with, uh, with it being less than 70%. And today, by the way, the ridership level is worse. It's only 60% of pre-pandemic levels. So why are these numbers so poor and low? Well, there's lots of reasons. And we discuss many of them throughout my book, Precipice, in the chapter on our urban centers and big cities. Um, it's expensive to ride public transportation. It's slow. 
It's often unreliable because of bottlenecks and breakdowns. It's not clean. Um, crime is a growing problem. The other alternatives like ride hailing, they're quicker and cleaner and safer. And remote work has not helped. It's emptied these downtown offices. And then the people who commute to them, now they're going to want to work from home or in the suburbs. You combine all this with taxes and cost of living, which are pushing people out of places like New York and Chicago and L.A. and San Francisco. And it's not shocking that we're seeing ridership levels um, that we're encountering. So this is not sustainable. It's far from it. And the MTA is expecting to see a $4 billion drop in ticket fare revenue over the next five years using these projections. The public transportation systems in our biggest cities, they're hemorrhaging cash, and they're doing so at an alarming rate. The business model is completely broken, but government, what does it keep doing? It keeps bailing out public transportation and ignoring the fact that people want to utilize it less than ever. But, you know, public transportation fits the ideology so the funding and the regulations and the infrastructure, they're all going to be set up to deny choice to the rider and make it effectively a fait accompli that the rider's going to have to use public transportation, which means the rider's going to want to stop going to the downtown area, they're going to want to stop working there, and they're ultimately going to want to stop living in that city. So one pulls the other one down in a circling of the drain. How about we stop funding and losing propositions that are denying the inevitable? Public transportation... It's a concept that ran its course, and now it needs to be drastically reimagined, not as a cure-all, but as a scaled-back, reasonable option to fit the facts and circumstances of each locale. And that shaky math of public transportation systems in our cities, guess what? It mirrors the shaky math of our next topic, which is the Federal Reserve when it comes to interest rates and inflation. So back a few weeks ago in late July, the Fed hiked rates another 0.75 percentage points. The FOMC of the Fed uh, stated at the time that it was, quote, highly attentive to inflation risks, end quote. So both of these things, the interest rate hike and the commentary, the soundbite, they both look and sound rational, considering that inflation is over 9% coming off of that June reading. And the Fed has said time and time again, right, it desires an inflation rate of around 2% which means a lot of work needs to be done to get the current 9 plus percent inflation rate much lower, hence the rate hikes of recent times. So things are seeming to, to fit together. But now you go another step further, things aren't going to add up. And the situation doesn't fit coherently when you're trying to put in the last piece of the puzzle. And that last piece of the puzzle is that with the recent rate hike, the Fed funds rate, it's sitting somewhere around two and a quarter to two and a half percent. And as we discussed in the past, real interest rates, that's the difference between the Fed funds rate and inflation. So if inflation is larger or higher than the Fed funds rates, the real interest rates are negative, and that's going to stoke inflation further instead of taming it and bringing it down. Worse yet, the Fed and Chair Powell, they're now talking as if they may lower rates next year if recession hits. So that's right. They're talking about going back potentially to cutting rates towards zero again. So the Federal Reserve is losing credibility by the press conference and by the released minutes. If you desire around 2% inflation and you've got actual inflation, it's over 9%, and the current Fed funds rate is about 2.5%, you've got to conclude that substantial rate hikes are called for now, not later. And to waver or delay or worse yet, hint that you might start cutting rates again, that's insanity and it cannot be viewed as the FOMC said of being, quote, highly attentive to inflation risks. Look, the Fed's being exposed, and that could come back to haunt it and the investment community and the economy if everybody starts to lose confidence in the Fed and what they're ultimately solving for in the end. So pay attention to how this plays out, which pulls me almost violently into the next topic to connect to. Inflation is primarily a monetary and money supply phenomenon, as Milton Friedman taught us. But fiscal spending from government, that also matters and, and works within the equation. And government has been pouring gasoline on the inflation fire for some time now, and it doesn't seem to be showing any interest in putting that gas can down anytime soon. So we saw $280 billion for semiconductor subsidy, and then what, $430 billion for climate and other spending goodies, um, government using taxpayer dollars to distort the markets, to dictate capital flows, and to push out the free market. That's a form of statism, 
uh, that Ludwig von Mises wrote about in Omnipotent Government, which I have a piece posted on nickdelius.com about, and we'll discuss at more length in an upcoming episode of The Far Middle. That's exactly what von Mises was talking about. Now, all of this honest graft and corporate subsidy that you find in these two spending bills for semiconductors and this other one tied to climate change and whatnot, it's in the name of good things, right? Competing with China, combating climate change. But make no mistake, over $700 billion of more government spending across these two bills, it's hurting the Fed's ability to tame inflation. Inflation net-net went up with these spending bills not down. And the Fed's behavior in positions on this, I find that pretty interesting as well. Now think about this. When there was the threat of deflation and the Fed was cutting rates because of COVID shutdowns, the Fed was vocally calling for and applauding major stimulus and spending bills from Congress at the time. We all remember that. But now we've got the opposite situation. Inflation's raging. It's a crisis. So that calls for fiscal discipline and reining in government spending. But Powell and the Fed They didn't say a word about this or criticize the $700-plus billion in new fuel to the inflation fire. Now, consistency in being apolitical, they're supposed to be the hallmarks of the Fed. I don't see it when you look at the record the past few years. The Fed looks to be playing politics, and I think you can infer where their leanings are these days, depending on their positions at different points in time and with different issues. And that brings up the next connection. How did the media report on this pair of $700 plus billion spending uh, sprees and hunt slots? Well, in typical media fashion these days, with some creative writing bordering on economic fiction, I could select dozens of examples to choose from, but my favorite perhaps was from a major global news service. Now, the article said, and I'm going to quote from the article, the bill includes $430 billion in new spending on energy, electric vehicle credits, and health insurance, and more than pays for itself by raising minimum taxes for big companies and enforcing existing tax laws, Schumer and Manchin said in a statement, end quote. So this is in reference, this is an article from a global news organization that's talking about the recent um, bill from, from Manchin and Schumer um, to tackle or combat climate change, etc. Now, a legitimate media outlet or a journalist would instantly take that statement to task instead of giving it credibility, that statement from the two senators, take it to task instead of giving it credibility like this major news service did. Think it through. Logic says that government spending pays for itself because government's going to tax the private sector and free market more. That's as twisted as one can get on economic logic. Taking from someone or something that creates value for itself to go then and give or feed another thing, that's not paying for itself. It's a reallocation of value, not creation of new value to offset the cost. There's a big, huge difference. Now, politicians are always going to be guilty of taking such liberties with Econ 101 and logic. That's what politicians do. So I'm not blaming Schumer or Manchin. Again, that's the nature of of who they are. Republicans and Democrats, that's what all politicians do. Senators and House members, federal and state politicians. But the media... They're supposed to be different. They're supposed to play a special role in this Republican democracy of ours, one where they call out the flawed logic and the nonsense that's coming from the political class. So instead of de facto trumpeting it, which is what you're getting here, the media is not supposed to be a cheerleader or a PR firm for a certain party or a certain ideology. It's supposed to be objective. And objectively speaking, These $700 plus billion in spending bills, they do not pay for themselves. They're funded instead by value appropriation from others. The makers are going to pay for the gifts in these bills to the takers. So let's see. Excessive regulation, government spending, those things create scarcity and fuel inflation. Then we regulate and spend more in government to fight inflation. Hmm. Things are so confusing these days, this type of logic, which brings us to the next dot to connect. You know, it used to be straightforward when an economy went into recession. It was two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Now, we were taught that in high school econ class, in college econ class, at MBA programs, and you heard it on CNBC in the morning. Now, that was the definition in the case when Republicans were presidents, Democrats were presidents, when Congress was was, uh, controlled by one party or the other or was split. Uh, when Volcker was running the Fed or when Greenspan was, but not anymore. And it depends today instead on whether we want a recession because it's convenient to attack those in power 
or whether we want to avoid a recession because it becomes something those in power own. This goes back to that once noble yet now hopelessly compromised institution of the media and their brethren in academia. Now, a recession is sort of in the eyes of the beholder. It's not simply two consecutive quarters of GDP shrinkage. Now it depends on a totality of factors, and feel free to use your own factors when assessing. You see where this is going, right? Can anybody say scientific consensus? Or can anyone say the majority of economists say that? That's your truth. There's my truth. There's somebody else's truth. And now there's my recession view, your recession view, and someone else's recession view. Economy and economic indicators, they've been hijacked by the thought police, just like scientific ones with energy, climate, and pandemic have been. And you know why we're doing this with the boring definition of recession, right? Because our media guardians and academics, they cannot stand the thought of a recession occurring with the left in power, especially considering the left caused the recession with MMT free money theory and orgy of spending bills, central planning when it comes to regulations on energy and everything else, and basically attacking the value creators while enabling and emboldening the despots. Now, they can't have that. So change the definition and make it subjective and then have those with the mics and the cameras and the social media platforms echo the no recession, nothing to see here, folks, storyline. Give Wikipedia, that so-called online encyclopedia, a read when you type in recession. And then look at the notes in edit history uh, when you're on that web page. Crazy that millions view that platform as fact-based and objective. It's nothing more than a popularity contest with certain votes and input counting more than others. In this phenomenon of manufacturing whatever definition suits you or fabricating whatever conclusion you desire, it's a big problem that mushrooms beyond defining when we're in a recession. And that brings us to our next connection, how scientific credibility, it's been destroyed by political science. As an engineer, it's a subject that I am quite passionate about and that I'm quite upset about. I discuss it at length in the STEM chapter uh, that you can find in Precipice, dive into how losing scientific rigor and integrity, it's making the United States less competitive against adversaries, particularly China. So give that chapter a read in Precipice if you get a chance. But in the meantime, uh, let me give you a couple of facts. And I warn you, it ain't pretty. Um, DARPA, what's DARPA? That's the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's big time. It's highly important to our national security. So DARPA knows a thing or two about scientific method. And in 2020, DARPA reported failure rates in replicating findings in social sciences papers. In 2009, the failure to replicate rate was 53.4%. So DARPA found that in 2018, the failure to replicate rate increased to 55.8%. Now what that means, when you think about it, is that a monkey flipping a coin has a better rate of success than PhDs replicating their results published in social science technical papers. And the actual failure to replicate rates would be much higher than even those sorry levels when you consider that a lot of this so-called research is tweaking inputs and assumptions to dial in the desired outcomes and results that conform to the ideology. So if you ran the study straight up with no manipulation of inputs and assumptions, many of the findings of social science papers would be debunked. And bias plays a big role these days in the social sciences. In a survey of 2,000 psychologists, half admit to selectively reporting experimental findings to develop results that match their preconceived views. And by the way, it gets really interesting when you sort of superimpose this upon our leadership. President Biden's lead to oversee the Scientific Integrity Task Force edited a technical paper on marine protected areas and fishing that the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences retracted. And the White House lead advisor back at the time of paper publication led the paper in question through the peer review process. And there was a slight conflict of interest problem because the White House's lead's brother-in-law authored the paper in question, and the White House lead also was the brother-in-law's advisor for his PhD. Ouch and double ouch. And then the White House advisor, who is the lead for the Scientific Integrity Task Force, used the paper to testify to Congress to promote for the need for more environmental regulation. Congressional ethics rules demand that she would have disclosed those conflicts. She did not. Ouch, double ouch, triple ouch. 
that's how science gets done these days. Nothing more than a useful tool to justify whatever regulation or business interest or lobbying effort or ideology needs supported. So there used to be science, which was run by the scientists and the engineers. And there was a corner of the quack world that was clearly junk science. And today, everything seems to have flipped now. And the political scientists and the ideologues, they got a hold of and control science and academia and the purse strings of research funding. Now the junk science dominates, and it's very hard to ascertain what's legitimate science and what is junk science. Remember our prior episode a while back where we discussed how the most dangerous phrase in the English language is becoming experts agree or experts say? It's truer than ever. But we're out of time, so let's bring episode 66 to a strong close. So we just finished a conversation on science and how much of it's turning into political or junk science. And that sort of makes me think about science fiction and how classic TV did such a great job with sci-fi. Twilight Zone, for sure, was the granddaddy of them all. My personal favorite was part sci-fi and part horror, and the show was called Night Gallery, hosted by the great Rod Serling, who, of course, was also the host of The Twilight Zone. Now, Serling was known as the angry young man of Hollywood. Uh, He railed against racism and censorship. He was a World War II vet in the Pacific, earned a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star. He tried boxing for a while. He ended up uh, breaking his nose in his first bout as well as in his last bout, so probably uh, wasn't what he was cut out for. In 1959, he started The Twilight Zone. It ran for five glorious seasons. I don't know if you are aware of this with The Twilight Zone, but there are some seasons that are half-hour episodes. There are other seasons that are hour-long episodes. And in 1969, he presented us with Night Gallery. And I just love Night Gallery. I love the atmosphere of that show, the art museum at night with Serling walking around strange paintings and talking about the episode you were about to see. It was almost as if his oratory was better than the actual episode itself. Now, he didn't take the greatest care of himself. He smoked four packs of cigarettes a day. It eventually caught up to him. He died in 1975, too young. Um, Binghamton, New York's finest, true artist of the TV medium. Uh, Two quotes from the great Rod Serling. First, We're developing a new citizenry, one that will be very selective about cereals and automobiles who won't be able to think. Wow, how pertinent and true is that today? And then the second quote from Mr. Serling, any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. I hope that's not too scary of a harbinger for where we're heading. Next stop, ladies and gentlemen, not the Twilight Zone, but Far Middle Episode 67. Stay strong, constant listeners. See you in a week.